How many of you guys uh, do deep learning? Not one. Okay, good. So this is it's going to be interesting. So uh, the first slide I always like to do is uh, AI is the new electricity, right? Uh, this is a quote from uh, Andrew Ng. M many of you know who is he, and uh, it's it's a new way of thinking how how all the um, application that we know today is, are going to change, and there is going to be this new uh, algorithmic way of uh, executing tasks. We have seen uh, um, the driving cars going around, while 10 years ago you will never really think that will happen. Oh, okay. Okay, so I, I had the pleasure to meet him a couple of weeks ago at Stanford. He gave a, a, a talk about uh, deep learning and uh, what's the future. So why, why deep learning? What's, what's new about this? Um, the first thing uh, uh, is we have a linear improvement with the amount of data. What does it mean? He drew this, uh, this graph that I tried to reproduce. And so you can see uh, with traditional algorithm, you get to some point where even adding more data does not help the performance of the algorithm. We are bound to some extent. But with uh, this new uh, deep learning model, it seems that uh, uh, even adding more data, they can just improve. And uh, uh, more, uh, more data improves the final performance of the algorithm. And it seems there is no really uh, an upper bound uh, so far. And that's what is driving a lot of uh, the excitement because of this, uh, uh, of this factor. Um, and the second uh, point I want to make about deep learning, why it's so exciting, is uh, the model scalability. Before, once you have one of these algorithms, you, are not, you can only play with the parameters of how you train it. You can really modify it. You can really augment it. Um, while with deep learning, you can. You, we find new uh, building blocks, and you can start to uh, stack them as Lego blocks. And these Lego blocks can create new blocks, and you start stacking one on top of it. In the last year, we have found so many ways of, uh, of doing this, and uh, it's been a very exciting time. So a little example I want to do is uh, this uh, playground that TensorFlow has made, just to have an, uh, an idea of uh, how, how powerful uh, these things can be. And it's pretty fun. So we, we want to, to uh, fit this data where you have two classes. You can see in the color orange and blue. And so right now we can't really fit it because only we, we have not enough what's called capacity in our neural network. But we, as, as we start to improve, uh, our uh, model by putting more neurons and more uh, uh, hidden layers, you will see that the, the system starts to, to, to have more uh, better ideas uh, and more power to, to classify this, uh, um, these points. So it's very empirical in some sense, but you see that uh, eventually it will start uh, Converging to to the right uh, uh, to the right shape. And so, what we create now, we, we where every time I add a hidden layer, I, I add a, um, a new a new block, uh, is uh, is creating a new algorithm. Okay, and. And this is, is, this is very, very powerful. Um, there is this composition, composio, uh, com where you can compose uh, blocks uh, uh, together. OK, I uh, uh, will keep going. Don't remember the exact configuration of the, of the neural network to make this uh, uh, work. Uh, So you, you, it's really empirical. You, you can uh, you can play uh, around, and you can see uh, some of the uh, known models that work for uh, uh, for well-known problems. Um, 
And so one of the, the most recent uh, uh, innovations is uh, we are able to, to train these convolutional neural networks. And so the, the normal neural networks are just layers of uh, matrix multiplication um, where each, each node is fully connected to the layer uh, before. Okay? Um, when you have, uh, think this is just as an array, when you have this configuration, it's pretty easy. But uh, when, uh, for images, uh, this becomes very expensive to compute the whole matrix multiplication. So what, uh, uh, what, um, what we do instead is uh, uh, taking a small window called a filter, and we, sh we uh, slide over the uh, original image, and we do that fully connected uh, uh, procedure of uh, uh, summing and multiplication only on that filter. And we create, as you see, uh, in this example, you have an image of 32 by 32 and three channels, usually RGB. Um, this blue box, blue box is uh, the computed features out of the image. And uh, that uh, uh, inner uh, block is the computed feature. So you multiply that same initial block multiple times with different uh, weights. So you have different representation of uh, the initial image. Uh, and if you, if you break it apart, you see uh, the, first, the first one is the image, the first uh, column, and then uh, the second uh, uh, is, uh, is the filter, and the, um, and the third, uh, uh, second and third uh, are the two filters, and then uh, the, the last column is the output of this, uh, of this procedure. And you have to think this about over all the image, over all of the slides. So it's a lot of computation. And this is the reason of the uh, race of necessity of using GPUs, because GPUs do this very fast, My, uh, 20 times faster than, uh, than CPUs. And the numbers always diverge based on who you talk, if Intel or NVIDIA. Um, so we have, we have this power of composability, and uh, you can imagine there has been a lot of empirical work of, okay, how do we compose this to make performance better? And the, the fact that you want to be able to compose, this makes uh, um, the need of having a, a tool, like the new frameworks that are coming up, of uh, being able to compose uh, the stacks in, uh, in different ways, but still be able to then uh, train it. And we train today with uh, uh, back propagation and uh, gradient descent. And the procedure is to compute the gradient between one layer and the, pre uh, and the previous one. And before the, uh, in the last uh, uh, years, before the last years, they, you will have to do it manually. And it's tedious work, very error prone. Uh, but now with new frameworks like TensorFlow, you are able to compute uh, uh, and specify only the, the forward part of your network, and they will be able to do uh, inference uh, of what is the gradient computation that you need for those operations. And so playing with this neural network has become much, much easier, and a lot of adoption is, uh, is currently going on. Um, so we can explore one of the most successful ones is for image classification. And uh, we can see uh, image classification uh, uh, statistic of how far we got in the, in the accuracy. This is uh, top uh, uh, one accuracy, uh, it means uh, you give an image to the, to the algorithm, and they're going to give you exactly what is the class of that image. And as you see, we are uh, with the latest one, that is Inception ResNet v2. This came out a couple of, couple of weeks ago. We already are about 80%. Um, we have also top five accuracy. And here, the results are even, uh, even better, with uh, the Inception ResNet uh, going 95.3. And it's estimated that the human accuracy of a trained man is below 95, it's around 94. And so there is this, all this excitement also for, uh, for this reason. But let's keep uh, talking why, again, deep learning is we have to do less feature engineering, okay? Uh, 
I think we know the gradient, uh, gradient boosting, you really need to, to manipulate the data in the right place to actually be able to, to fit it properly. Okay, you need to do some uh, uh, feature engineering. While uh, in, in the example that we saw with the, the neural networks, you just give uh, data. It has to be normalized, just so the numeric uh, part of it is, uh, is stable. But you don't really need to, to uh, do too many uh, image, uh, uh, too many feature manipulation. And that's because neural networks are able to, to learn the most useful features. And so the question rise, rises of how does this uh, self-learned feature look like? Okay, we have an image as an input. We have these matrix multiplications. What, what does a, a feature for an image look like? And before, uh, all the, the field of uh, computer vision will, will have uh, handmade filters or kernels that had some magic numbers inside it that will be able to detect patterns. Uh, most uh, common ones were the, the Gabor filters. But incredible enough, these neural networks are able to, to find by themselves, with this training procedure, these filters by themselves. Okay? Um, and these are the typical, the interesting part of this is these are the features that are only at the first level. So the second level of a neural network uses the, the, the feature of the first level to compose and create new features at the, at the second level until you get high level feature of what is a car, what is uh, a bus. And I wanted to show a little, uh, a little video here of of these researchers, uh, um, I think they are in, in Berkeley, they did uh, uh, a nice demo that showed that some of these, uh, these are neurons in, inside, that the, inside the neural network, those weights that we saw before. Some of the neurons, like in this case, uh, is able to, sp to, to find the vertical lines. You see the total energy of the, of the cell is max when uh, there is a, vertical line inside the image. Now if you guys can see the it's right in the middle. While all the other neurons are basically zero mean the black means that it's zero as an activation function and white means it's close to one. And this is other example is a very interesting uh, video that shows all these uh, features. This feature is able to detect face. Is just activates when he sees a face inside the the, um, the image. This other one uh, activates when he sees two faces. So it starts it starts by uh, finding these uh, these features, these uh, uh, signals inside the the big the data that you provided. And so. To train these uh, images uh, uh, classification with neural network, you really need a lot of, uh, of images because uh, the pattern arise over thousands and thousands uh, of images. And, and before, uh, we were not able to, to compute even all this amount of, of information. And so now the question is, okay, we are able to use and create this uh, this feature, what can we do? Can we use it uh, back in the, in, the, in the previous world? Right? They, this, what, what does it mean learning a feature? OK, so there is this very, very interesting concept of autoencoders. And so what's the idea here? The idea is we have a neural network that it will uh, absorb some data. And we have uh, uh, Layers that will shrink at some point. At the, at the beginning, you have, uh, let's say, as an example, you have 100 uh, neuro neurons, uh, you have 50, and then you go down to 10 neurons. But then you expand the network again, where you go from 10 back to 50, back to 100. And you want to say to the, to the neural network, you have to minimize the difference between the input and the output. Okay? And the input and the output are the same image. And so what this thing does is compressing. It finds some configuration of the neural network in the middle that is able to represent this information. 
And this is, uh, is uh, used extensively in NLP today, and it's called word to vec Well, you get the words and you compress it in a vector of space. Um, and there is what this uh, space looked like. And I have a little interactive uh, galaxy where all the images are compressed and you have a representation of, of, of your words. I think this, uh, there is another uh, processing step of mapping it. Uh, it's called TSNI that maps it to a 2D so it can be uh, displayed. But the inner, uh, uh, the inner feature out are computed with uh, a neural network. OK, one of my favorite code is, yeah, talk is cheap. <laughs> Show me the code. And so I have a, a little. Uh, um, a little demo that uh, shows that shows uh, how to do this uh, with uh, 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 neural networks. And uh, what we do here, this is uh, uh, HUO, and uh, we are connecting to uh, what is uh, what is um, my cluster that is in, in California. And uh, we are going to use uh, what we have is an autoencoder estimator. And uh, the data set that I use is uh, the Olivetti image uh, classification. And so what I do with this is uh, beside the, the data managing and try to read the, the, the data from the image format down to array, uh, we have a, a, a zero to one uh, grayscale image as an input. And uh, we create a data frame with all the images, so all the rows. I take the image, I unroll it, so it's just an array. Okay, and uh, for each row is an image. Okay, so we have this big table with each row an image of this face. And what I say to the to the encoder, please encode this this space of all the images. What's a representation of all the images of human faces? The size of the image uh, is uh, 112 by 92. So this is a demo, just, yeah, sure. just to play around. And you train this using H2O? Correct. This, this is our implementation of the autoencoder. Uh, and it's just Java based and it's already in production. So you can download it and play with this yourself. You don't need GPUs because of the size of this neural network. And, uh, there are nice things about that. You don't need always a neural network, right? If, if your uh, uh, problem is, is little, no need to have GPUs and all of that. Um, and with this example, we are able to encode uh, uh, all these images. We just give to the neural network, OK, what's, what's the representation of, uh, of, uh, of all these images, of all these faces? And then to understand. To understand what's this hidden space of, uh, of values, we feed in uh, uh, noise, and this is what we get out. Okay, and it's a real semblance of of the faces of of that category. So it's it's, it's very interesting of how is is able to to uh, to do this totally unsupervised. I didn't say to the algorithm in any way that those are faces, while us as a human are able to see this as a, a, as a face. OK. And so one application that is, uh, is being used of, uh, of the old world and the new world is, OK, can we just create new features to add to the old features? And we get a better model altogether. And this is uh, a technique that uh, uh, Google uh, had a nice post uh, about it and shows how you have wide and deep models, where with the wide are the old uh, feature-based, feature-engineered uh, uh, approach, but then you have this new additional feature that are coming from this autoencoding uh, uh, algorithm. OK, so uh, this is. How do we put this uh, algorithm uh, then in production? Okay, because uh, we want to get these features, we get uh, all these nice algorithms, but our work doesn't end with uh, with that image. We want to put um, in uh, in a server. We want to have uh, either a, uh, an API or sometimes just uh, a report of what's what's the best uh, thing to do. And uh, with HUO, 
we are trying to uh, create uh, a nice framework for doing deep learning. And so the idea is uh, not everyone is going to be able to have uh, GPUs on their machine, but most likely in big company you have a server dedicated to it. And, and the idea, uh, thanks to the HO, you can send the Python code over a REST API. So your code on your machine is very lightweight, but the, the computation all happens on the, on the, on the data cluster. And um, what we are leveraging to, uh, to do this big computation on, uh, on thousands of images, bigger images, so you need the GPUs for the reason that we talked before. And uh, there are very nice uh, frameworks, and we, we are integrating with them. Uh, the first one is uh, MXNet, uh, TensorFlow, and Cafe. And so what you do is uh, you connect to uh, our HO cluster, you in ingest all the data from, uh, from Spark, uh, then you execute uh, uh, this data over uh, uh, frameworks like TensorFlow and MXNet without leaving the HO context. And so you have uh, uh, the ability to, to model using TensorFlow. You want the ability to use uh, MXNet or CAFE, because each one of these frameworks have uh, uh, some uh, sweet spot for the, the typical, uh, uh, for some of the, of the problems. But the nice thing is then you don't have to, to put in production each one of these frameworks. You just use HO overall and just worry about the model all the engineering part of deploying it and putting uh, API and making sure the model is different is all in the same pipeline. You just need to w uh, worry about the model, make sure uh, that uh, the, the expertise you have is on the, on the problem that you're trying to solve, not on engineering problems. We solve those for you. And so uh, the example that we saw it was uh, HO deep learning, CPU only, Java distributed. And deep water is the new product that is able to use and leverage this uh, new framework. And as I was mentioning, you get uh, all the deep learning framework with the batteries included. Okay, if you ever try to install uh, TensorFlow or MXNet, uh, you have to compile C++, you need to have the libraries. It's doable, but it will get a uh, few days of your time to, to get it right. While you could start implementing uh, algorithms. And so all the, all the things that you want and you need to get to production, like uh, um, hyperparameter optimization, cross-validation, hyperparameter search, early stopping, all these things that you need when you are creating uh, dozens of models uh, at a time, especially with if you have a big data science team, each one is uh, using the cluster, you want to have some process on having a good pipeline of taking out uh, models. And some of the, mo some of the uh, neural networks are very empirical, so you can get lost trying to uh, build your own. We provide pre-built models of, the of those that are known to be good. So all the image net uh, models are pre pre-baked, pre-tested, uh, they just work, you just need to invoke. Of course, torque is cheap, <laughs> show me the code. And so, what I want to show you here is, uh, uh, we have an extensive library of examples on uh, our website, so you can download the notebooks, just play it around. Um, but I want uh, to, to show in specific, hold on. So this is another uh, uh, tiny problem, it's a CIFAR 10, com how to classify 10 images. And in this, in this problem, we are uh, uh, also there loading the images, uh, having uh, uh, unrolling all the batch and creating a new data frame inside the uh, H2O. And as you see, these are some example of the images. They are 32 by 32 image. We initialize our H2O cluster. We create our data frame of uh, test uh, and, and label. Notice that we do not, do not send uh, uh, the data from Python to HO. We just say, where is the image? Because then the HO cluster can parallelize that uh, fetching of information. Imagine if it's URLs. It will just grab everything in parallel, as many cluster you have, and the bandwidth of your data center, and create this big uh, 
data uh, memory block that then is able to feed very fastly to the GPU because the GPU now is faster than fetching uh, your data. Before with big data you had to wait for the disk to, to load, but now, right now no, the GPU is so fast that you have to uh, feed it uh, properly. And so what we have here is uh, an HO deep water estimator where we only have to specify uh, this network name. And this network is uh, um, one of the famous image classification network, a few years old uh, right now. Um, but, but just specifying that, uh, uh, that name, the system then will load in the background all the neural network pre-built uh, and run it over the cluster. And so you have different values of, uh, of this network. Uh, as of today, uh, you have uh, Lenet, uh, AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, Inception, GoogleNet. Um, but the nice thing about that is you can do uh, a grid search over which one of those algorithms is the best one for your specific product, for your specific problem, for your specific data. Yes, pre-built by us, they already backed in that the system so just does a lookup and load, yes. Was already, you already created the model, fit the model on that. Uh, no, just the neural network, just the architecture. Like the layers and yes, the yes. Layers and this is, these are famous, uh, yeah. those are published, sure. so <laughs> we know that they work. Okay, uh, Yes, we still train on your data. Yeah, otherwise, otherwise we'll try to find the classes on on the on. It's of. Not like uh, no, but you can do that. You can train, and the idea is, you initialize the ne this neural network as a random state with some pro uh, with some uh, properties. Uh, but then, if you have a, a s an initial state that is better than a random state, you can utilize that. There are some constraints, like the, no the number of weights has to be more uh, or less uh, the same uh, as a number of layers, and you have to do some matching when you do transfer, uh, transfer learning. But the, if the input image is the same and the number of classes uh, uh, as an output is the same, you can do, you can do something uh, uh, like that. But of course, uh, this is, is a bit uh, uh, of a limitation of having just uh, uh, pre-baked uh, models. But indeed, what you can do is uh, um, you're able to insert your own, uh, your own uh, uh, image, your own Im image uh, algorithm. And uh, this is an example of, of using MXNet. So this is the state of the art of image classification uh, as of today. And this from Google, the Inception ResNet V2. As you see, it's, it's a very deep network. All of those are layers. Okay, you have 10 layers of this first configuration, 20 layers of the second, 10 layers of the la And it takes like a week to train over millions of images. And what Google did is, after it trained, it just gives the weights out. And you can load these weights and start retraining on your specific uh, data set. This is exactly transfer learning. Um, what I want to show here is how you can use MXNet. This is the MXNet Python library. Okay, so untouched, downloaded from, uh, from the repository. And we build, uh, using that library, the graph representation of our neural network. So we compose using Python. You see all the layers, okay, this is a convolution network, then concave. You can really play around and build a, a neural network. And then simply you can then, uh, uh, this is the loading of the, of the data, then you can simply uh, allocate by the number of classes that you need and then save it as a representation. So the input is just a JSON file. And if we look at this uh, JSON file, so I'm just taking out the first line, 10 lines of the, of the file, it's just JSON. It just specifies what are the nodes, what are uh, uh, 
The inputs is just uh, uh, an MXNet specification. And what we do here is then import that exact file inside uh, the deep water estimator. Okay? And this, this loads all the, all, the, all the network layers inside the, the GPU, and then uh, we continue with our H2O uh, process of checkpointing, uh, imaging, and uh, all, uh, all of the engineering work that you need to, to test uh, your, uh, uh, your model. And so what you will be doing is back and forth from this cell, where is your network, down to, to execute. So ideally, what I want you to guys to do is you just need to press uh, run subsequent cell. And you modify the, the, the network and run it again. And this is, will connect to H2O. H2O will take care of, of running it as a job and everything. And then we have other, other tools down the line where, OK, well, over, over uh, a week, you can do this back and forth. But over multiple months, you need to have a, uh, a system that compares how this new model compares to the to the one that is uh, in production. Um, I don't know how much time uh, do we have. I think it's about to to wrap up. Um, so I wanted to show you a little bit of the code that we have. Uh, for uh, for doing all that uh, uh, tuning of uh, hyperparameter search, uh, this is this example online shows on the on the deep learning uh, part. So we build uh, we build our uh, uh, our model, but then then we want to to start uh, inspecting it, and you have the the confusion matrix here. Um, we want to, to test if actually predicts uh, uh, the right thing. Uh, we want to maybe have a variable importance. OK, what, which one of all the variables that we, we created is the most important one? And this is something that we pre-computed uh, already. OK, so you don't have to. You can go and write again, but this is repetitive work. You should not be doing that. Um, and this is another nice feature of, uh, of uh, the H2O framework is you can just do grid search on the hyperparameter. And remember, it's everything distributed. OK, Scikit does it on your machine, but we do it over the cluster. So you're not bounded by where you are running it. And so from a nice console, you just launch multiple, uh, multiple jobs. You can put uh, is, uh, this HUO, uh, deploying HUO is copying this jar file on a machine. And then you do java dash jar, and, the, and the, the node will, uh, will come up. And yes, you can spin up an AWS instance with tons of gigabyte uh, of uh, RAM and uh, CPU, uh, spin it up, have a VPN, always good, and then connect from your laptop to that machine and start sending uh, Python code. And your, your code, uh, you can do the, the saving of the code on your machine, because this, the Python API just sends API call. Okay, so it's a nice framework uh, to work with. And then you just need to specify, for example, here, the hyperparameter that you want to, to do the grid search on. This is, we specify in this example, I think this is a bit, uh, I just realized. So. These are, uh, OK, try with uh, this configuration of hidden layer. This is uh, a, a fully connected uh, neural network. So everything is the first simple example that we did. And so the system will do a Cartesian search so for each combination of the first uh, uh, parameter, it will do a combination of the second one. OK, so this one with this one, this one with this one, this one with this one, over and over. And of course, this for a small set that you want to, to, to optimize is good enough. But sometimes, and most of the case, you need uh, what's called random grid search, where you just specify, OK, well, this, this is the range of valid uh, L1 parameters. Okay, Just do a random search over all the space and uh, specify how much, what's the maximum time that you want to wait. Okay, So you say, OK, in this. Five minutes, 
give me the best you can find uh, as an algorithm doing uh, a random search of this hyperparameter. And of course, this, this is, you can launch multiple processes. It depends on your, uh, on your uh, resources and the, on the back end. Um, and the last uh, point is you have model checkpoints. So if you're running this for a week, at some point, uh, things can happen. No? The, the AWS itself can fail. What, what uh, this system uh, does is uh, uh, checkpointing. It will save the complete state of your, uh, of your search and, uh, and your uh, model in a, in a serialized format. And then you can reload in a second time. You can shut down the AWS, copy, you copy first the, the data, shut down the AWS. Next days, you copy over the, the data and reload. Um, and this is, is all, uh, it's all built in, it's all uh, ready to, to use without writing additional code and do through the engineering process of doing all these, uh, these steps. Okay, so uh, last announcement, uh, we are doing uh, um, an open tour in Dallas where we're gonna show more demos, more uh, hands-on approach on how to use HUO. And um, if you want, guys want to meet there, uh, I have a promo code, HUO Yeah, you get a nice discount on, the, on that event. Uh, if you guys want to learn more and have more uh, uh, documentation and code, it's all uh, online. This is completely open source, by the way. It's, you, you download it, you hack it, you can change it, ready. And so this, that's it, 40 minutes sharp. Thank you. Any question? Do you guys use deep learning on any, any little bit? Yeah, so state of the art of NLP it uses deep learning. Anything, or even the famous uh, NLP professor Stanford, uh, one of his uh, pupils uh, is create a company and is sold to Salesforce and they were the NLP doing uh, uh, deep learning. So uh, it's something to, to look at it and play with it. The tools now are amazing. It's very easy and fun to, to play around. So the idea is we use Py Python is very good to manipulate. No? You have this uh, maneuverability of code and, and data. But uh, with TensorFlow, what we do is uh, we get this power and we create out um, a computational flow graph. And this is what we were, I was showing here. OK? So with Python, you just specify how does this look like? And once you have this representation, usually a JSON file like we saw, or like another format, you can send it to some execution engine. In this case, in our case, in the H2O execution engine, we read the graph, we understand what are the, the operation, and we execute it. And so you have, you have this uh, division between the representation of what needs to be done and who is going to do it. And so with this thing, uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit more involved doing the, the specification. You don't use the structure of the language itself. No? When you do x plus y, you, you're using the tree of, of the language to understand what's the computation. You have to specify or add x to, to y. But then you have this nice property that you can then execute uh, in, uh, other, uh, in other environments. And so, uh, with TensorFlow, you will import TensorFlow, create your own graph, and then you export as a, you do a save, and you export as a protocol buffer is the format of TensorFlow. And then you, you specify that protocol buffer to HO. HO is able to reconstruct the graph, use TensorFlow for the, for the GPU operations. And uh, once that cycle is, uh, is complete, it returns the, the, the accuracy, all those parameters that then we compute and is continuous with the usual pipeline. And of course, we package TensorFlow, we make sure it's, it's working, you don't have to install it. That's, so that's always good to have. It's integration work, is, uh, it takes a lot of time. Yeah. 
Yes, that's completely independent. So when when you when you um, when you create the graph, you can specify okay, I want to have access also to TensorBoard, and it will uh, it will write the the data to some directory. You have to be a bit aware of where you're writing those files, but then you can launch TensorBoard on top of that. Um, one thing that I forgot to 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 show you guys that is very interesting is we have something very similar to, uh, to TensorBoard. This, this is a command control of the H2O cluster where you can show, okay, give me all the models that are being trained, give me all the jobs that are running. And then for, it, for the model, you can, you can explore what's the, what's the status, uh, what's the scoring history. And one thing that we do uh, compared to TensorBoard uh, is this is a real-time update. So as you're training, you will see how this is uh, uh, updating. Um, but yes, that's, that's the thing is you, you are free to do uh, normal TensorFlow or MXNet operation, but then when you really want to, to put in, in the production pipeline and you need access to the remote cluster and not everyone can access to the cluster, then you just serialize it as a protocol and put it as a job queue and it would be processed. That's it. Thank you.